tradition tells us the Buddha gave a Dharma talk one time during his first year of teaching. 1,250 arahants all met spontaneously on the afternoon of the full moon in February. We don't have any record of the talk, but we do have a record of the verses that summarized it at the end. And the very first line in the verse is that the highest austerity is patient endurance. And it's important that we understand where patience and endurance are appropriate and where the effort to change things is appropriate. Because sometimes we get the idea that if you're, the teaching is basically teaching us to be passive. Whatever comes up, you endure. Whatever comes up, you're patient. And equanimity means just putting up with whatever comes past, which is not the case. The things the Buddha has us endure are, on the one hand, difficult things outside that are lie beyond our control. And the other is he has us learn how to endure pain, discomfort. And so to endure these things, the trick is not simply sitting there and enduring, but learning how to find another spot where you can place your mind so it doesn't feel oppressed by these things. This is why we practice meditation, to give the mind in some alternatives. As the Buddha said, if your only alternative to pain is sensual pleasure, you're going to go for the sensual pleasure. And when you're stuck in a place where there's pain, discomfort, that's all you're going to be able to think about is how you're going to find some pleasure. in terms of things outside. So what you've got to learn how to do is find pleasure inside. And this is why we meditate. So we've got our inner resources. That simply being with the breath can be a pleasurable experience. And you've got this whole field to play with, the breath energy in the body. You want to be able to tap into that whenever you can. So that the things that are difficult outside don't weigh so heavily on you. As for the things we don't endure, they come in two types. One, they're the things that Buddha says, the Buddha says not to tolerate at all. In other words, when thoughts of sensual desire arise in the mind, he says, don't tolerate them. Do what you can to wipe them out. Again, this requires a certain amount of skill. Because for most people, the only alternative to indulgence is you know, repression, to deny that they're there. And denying that they're there doesn't help at all. You have to admit, this is a problem. You've got these thoughts. Only when you admit that they're problems can you deal with them. Thoughts of ill will, thoughts of doing violence, these are the things the Buddha says not to tolerate at all. When you find them arising in the mind, do what you can to get rid of them. And one way of getting rid of them, again, is to focus back on your meditation. This is your refuge. The more you work with the breath, the more familiar you are with the breathing. The more alternatives you'll have for whatever comes up in the mind that's unskillful. Wrong resolve, wrong thinking. So you do what you can to put these things out. It's like a fire. As soon as a fire gets started, you try to put it out. If, because if you don't, well, you, well, you can see what happens when a fire doesn't get put out right away. And the destruction we've seen all around us for the past couple of days is nothing compared to the destruction that these unskillful thoughts can do in your mind. So that's something you're not supposed to tolerate. You don't just sit there and say, oh, here comes 
a thought of ill will. Well, let's just let's watch the thought of ill will and see where it's going to go. You need to have an alternative place to put the mind before you can actually watch these things. Your first line of defense is not simply to watch them, but to figure, try to figure out what you can do to put them out, or at least give the mind another place where it can stand, so that it watches them. It watches them from a slight distance. And if you find yourself getting pulled into the thought, you have your ways of pulling yourself out. The other things the Buddha says not to endure are things he says to avoid. You read the list and it sounds pretty common sense. He says the monk knows how to avoid a wild dog, a wild elephant, in other words, wild animals, a bramble patch, stumps cliff, a chasm, open cesspools, open sewers, i.e., you use your common sense. If there's something you can avoid, if there's a danger you can avoid, you avoid it. Equanimity doesn't mean saying, well, here comes the fire, it's just going to burn us. Okay, let's just sit here and watch it burn us. You can get away, you get away. There's a really obnoxious story that's told by one of John Cha's Western students who's now a lay teacher. One time they were going through a, a really rough jeep ride, part of the back country there in Ubon. And the driver was pretty careless, and he was rushing down this road. It was a really bumpy road, and a John Chai was holding on tight to the point where his knuckles were white. And the Western student saw this, and he said, ah, John Cha has fear. Thought he'd caught him in a defilement. He wasn't perfectly equanimous. Well, John Cha had the good sense to hold on tight. You ride a rough jeep ride like that, you've got to hold on. I mean, it's stupid to die or in, let yourself get injured when it's avoidable. So if there are dangers you can avoid, you avoid them. The Buddha is not telling us to abandon common sense. Equanimity, endurance have their proper sphere, but you have to know the proper sphere in order to function properly, in line with the teaching. Fire is not enough, there's an earthquake. Gosh. So suppose that earthquake just now was just a tiny tremor. Suppose it had been really large. You do what you can to get out of the building if it's falling down. Only when you find yourself in a situation where you can't do anything at all, that's when you develop equanimity and patience. And it can be range anything from really severe physical pain just to difficulties. When you find yourself in places that are less than ideal to practice, but during the fire, we found ourselves squeezed into some houses that were smaller than we than when they're used to being, and especially here where you can wander around as as you like. And we were fortunate we had those places to go to, and so when you find yourself in squeezed circumstances, you learn how to make yourself small. This is something I had to learn in Thailand. We'd have these festivals. Like once a year, they had the commemoration for John Lee's passing away, and you'd have hundreds of monks and thousands of lay people descending on this one monastery. And so, in a place that was designed to hold three people, you suddenly find ten or twelve sleeping on the floor, sleeping all around. And it was just a minor inconvenience. But being American, one of my Problems is I have a large sense of my space. And so I learned how to make that space smaller. As John Fung would often say when he was asking me to do something that was a little bit more difficult than I wanted to do, he'd say, Is it going to kill you? Well, it's no, it's not going to kill you. Okay, well, learn how to adjust. And again, learn how to look inside for your space. Because there's not only the breath here in the body, but if you look very carefully and get the mind really still, you sense the 
space element, and that's infinite. No boundaries on that at all. If you tap into that, then physically you can be in a very confined space. But the mind has a sense of awareness that seems to permeate everything. You sense not only the space between the atoms in your body, but the space in between the atoms and the walls around you, the people around you. If there's a whole city around you, there's space all around you. There's a space that permeates the entire city. So what this comes down to is that you have to learn these skills for finding space and well-being inside. When things outside are confining, when things outside are difficult. So that you're not constantly feeding on the thought of how difficult the conditions are. Conditions are conditions. You've got this alternative skill. And as you focus on the skill, the difficulties of the outside conditions don't weigh on you at all. Or if they do, it's very minor. You know they're there, but it's no big deal. Because you've got this whole other realm, this whole other dimension that you can focus on. I'm frequently asked about the time I was in Thailand, what was the most difficult part, especially during those first years? What was the hardest thing to adjust to? And I stopped thinking, you know, I still can't think of an answer to that question. But I realized that the fact that I never focused on one particular thing as the hardest thing to adjust to was probably why I was able to adjust. In other words, in, in other words instead of focusing on the difficulties, you focus on the opportunities. The things outside that you can change, you change them. Dangers you can escape, you escape them. As for things you can't change and can't escape, you learn how to live with them, but not by focusing on them or feeling oppressed by them, but realizing you have this other dimension inside. And there's a lot to explore here, from simple things like giving you a place to stand throughout the day as you go through your, your chores the work around the monastery, learn how not to regard that as an obstacle for the, for the practice, but actually an opportunity to practice in a particular way, learning how to stand with the breath and not get knocked off by difficulties. Or if the mind does get knocked off, you learn how to pick it up and put it back in place right away. From that skill, you learn that there are other skills that can help you in more difficult circumstances. So the conditions around you don't weigh on the mind. So even though you're putting up with them, you're enduring them, it's, there's no sense that you're being weighed down by the endurance. You don't think about how long it's been oppressing you or how much longer in the future it might be oppressing you. Just here with the present moment and you look at the opportunities for escape. You've got escape routes in the present moment with the breath and with the formless objects of concentration, space, consciousness, the dimension of the infinitude of space, the infinitude of consciousness. Those are huge openings. And so when you're not obsessed about the past or the future or the difficulties in the present, you find there are these openings in the present. And as you make the most of them, then the question of patience, endurance, equanimity, tolerance, these become a lot easier to handle.